entire ecosystem at that point, all the projects doing their own ICOs during the 2017 phase, uh, started adopting this multi-signature wallet as well. In the long run, these smart accounts will be the solution and there's no way around smart accounts in order to get to the user experience while still retaining like security uh, that is needed to, to onboard like a billion people to, to Web3. I would say when it comes to cross-chain, uh, smart accounts in the short term will bring new challenges. In, in the long run, will actually solve cross-chain in a way that it can uh, make it irrelevant in what uh, networks you interact with, what dApps, but this can be abstracted away. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization in the blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastien Couture, and today I'm all by myself. I'm chatting with Lucas Shore, who's the co-founder at SAFE. Safe is, of course, the leading uh, smart account multi-sig provider in the EVM ecosystem. They're securing over $100 billion in assets and are absolutely crushing it when it comes to securing assets. We use Safe at Interout Ventures, and I'm sure lots of you out there are also using Safe. Um, they were spun out of Gnosis a couple of years ago, and I'm going to be talking with Lucas today about the technology behind SAFE, but also the strategy moving forward and what does the future of SAFE look like. Before we talk to Lucas, here's a quick word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like SAFE, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45-plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high-yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Hey, Lucas. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Sebastian. So before we get started, um, how did you become part of the SAFE team? Were you previously at Gnosis or, uh, yeah, because I think you're like a, one of the co-founders of SAFE. What's the story there? Yeah, that's right. Um, so SAFE is a spin-off from, from Gnosis. Uh, I joined back in 2019 uh, as a product manager uh, responsible for the, at that point, Gnosis SAFE project within Gnosis. Actually, I was applying half a year before that to Gnosis in, in the marketing department. I got rejected right away. Uh, that's just a, a fun fact on the side. Uh, then half a year later, uh, something that was more relevant to my, my background, the product manager role opened up and I was... Uh, jumping on that, and that was luckily uh, successful. So I joined when the Gnosis Safe project was quite at its early stages. Yeah, then took over uh, together with Richard and Tobias, my co-founders, the uh, yeah, project responsibilities. And over time, then the the project grew, uh, and it outgrew to some extent Gnosis, as in the uh, kind of the team uh, size grew and the 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 focus kind of expanded beyond what it's originally meant to be and it became, became its own ecosystem and that's when we decided together with uh, the Gnosis team that it's better off to uh, continue the project outside. Yeah, maybe a little bit of the history 
of uh, how this project came to begin with. Um, so Gnosis, like back in 2016, was was started to create prediction markets. So that's a, a way to financially incentivize uh, participants to share their knowledge in order to yeah, expose that knowledge uh, to, to the public. And that's meant to be as a, as a primitive on the Ethereum blockchain. And uh, Gnosis went ahead and did a, an ICO in order to fund that project. And it happened that uh, the ICO was quite successful. Uh, Gnosis had to custody uh, a lot of the uh, proceedings from, from that ICO. And back then, the entire self-custody infrastructure was quite early on, uh, meaning that they had to create uh, their own solution. So Stefan George, who is the co-founder of Gnosis, wrote himself a multi-signature contract, uh, which is a way to uh, share the yeah, responsibility of a self-custody setup with other people uh, by multiple keys. And that was uh, used for, uh, for the ICO uh, funding and was open sourced. And then it happened that all we have the entire ecosystem at that point, all the projects doing their own ICOs during the 2017 phase uh, started do adopting this multi-signature wallet as well. Um, and that's how the team was formed as suddenly you had many projects that were uh, using this solution and there were feature requests coming in and uh, people wanted to have the project maintained. And so the, the project formed and became its own uh, team within Gnosis. And that's roughly when, when I joined. Yeah, cool. I mean, I think it bears reminding also that like, you know, back then, like you said, there were no good solutions for doing multi-stakeholder asset uh, custody. Bitcoin had an on-chain in-protocol solution, still has. And, you know, in Bitcoin, you can create an on-chain multi-sig. And, you know, this is something that a lot of people, like including myself, have used, you know, with Epicenter, we've used this also quite a bit in the early days when we were a a Bitcoin only company. Um, but yeah, the, even even then, like it's quite cumbersome to set up the keys and, and everything. But Ethereum didn't have an on protocol solution. Do you know why that is? Like why Ethereum uh, didn't go down the same path as Bitcoin and build, build an in protocol uh, way to do multi stakeholder asset custody? Yeah. I mean, it's always the question, what should be really enshrined as part of the protocol and what should be then solved the layer above on the smart contract level. Um, it actually happened that Ethereum originally wanted to have smart accounts. Uh, so accounts that base their logic on smart contracts uh, kind of have, to have this natively within Ethereum. Uh, it was then, uh, yeah, it turned out that this is quite complex uh, to do and the team uh, at the Ethereum Foundation was a bit of in a in a in a time rush to to launch mainnet, uh, so the de scoped it last minute, and we since then had our uh, wallet infrastructure on Ethereum mostly based on EOAs, so externally owned accounts. These are the the accounts everyone knows that are controlled by a single private key, uh, usually derived from from a seed phrase, twelve four twenty four word uh, secret phrase. And uh, that's where the, the wallet infrastructure was, was built upon. I personally think that it's a, a better pathway to solve as much as possible on, on the smart contract level there in terms of like logic of, of an account. Because if you look at what you mentioned, the, the Bitcoin multi-sig implementation, it, uh, it, it works quite nicely for certain use cases, but it's quite limited because you have all the logic enshrined in the, in the Bitcoin protocol. And uh, for example, that means that Certain use cases, such as rotating keys, uh, is not possible with the Bitcoin multisig. So you once can set up your multi-signature wallet. You might have a certain threshold of uh, signatures required to make transactions. Uh, but then if you lose access to, to one of the keys or it gets compromised, you actually have to move your funds to a completely new Bitcoin multisig. Uh, and you cannot uh, just rotate one key and, and continue with, with the same wallet. These things are, are solved by uh, just leaving the logic up to the smart contract level and allowing different implementations to take different optimizations uh, and different uh, yeah, technical assumptions. And this creates much more flexibility then. And over time, we will probably see certain standards or certain uh, best practices emerge. And potentially at some point, these can be enshrined again 
in the Ethereum protocol uh, once, once we see that these are actually uh, must-haves and kind of the standardization value is higher than the flexibility of having different implementations. Yeah, I think the enshrinement question is one that needs a lot of, of course, reflection and we need to be careful about what we enshrine into the protocol or not. But yeah, taking a step back from that, let's maybe dive into smart accounts or at least the way uh, smart accounts are conceived of in the Ethereum space. I think most of the uh, research is around this ERC-4337 yeah, give us an overview of what is ERC-4337 and how it aims to implement smart accounts on EVM chains. Yeah, there's actually quite some misconceptions still on what ERC-4337 is. So some people think that ERC-4337 is smart accounts and all the logic, all the possibilities that are uh, enabled through this standard kind of is, is due to the, to the ERC-4337 standard while most of the features such as recovery or like session keys and so on are actually the, the responsibilities of the smart accounts. So smart accounts have existed since since years. Um, yeah, SAFE has been around since five, six years. And uh, a lot of what we're now talking when we talk about the potential of 457 has been possible before with one exception, which is actually processing smart account transactions in a trustless way. That's a big uh, problem that's solved by ERC-4337. So as I mentioned, the Ethereum protocol, like it it has two types of accounts, this EOA, externally owned account, and smart contracts, which can then be used to make smart accounts. And uh, yet a transaction actually, in order to be processed, needs to originate from an EOA. And um, that's, that's a challenge because yeah, certain use cases of smart accounts, you actually might not even want to have an EOA involved if you use uh, certain like new signature schemes, uh, pass keys or so on, uh, where where there's no EOA uh, part of the transaction lifecycle. Yeah, but uh, so far how it worked is that you had to fulfill the uh, transaction verification requirements, be it in a multi-sig case that you collect the different signatures from the participants, uh, but then still you need to have an EOA involved in, in the transaction uh, in order to actually process that transaction on the Ethereum blockchain. So, so usually how that worked is that you had like everyone signed the transaction and then the last person uh, that was signing was, was the poor person that actually had to pay for the transaction fee from his uh, EOA account. And yeah, that's now now coming to ERC-4357. So just, just, one, one, just to kind of put a pin in that, Essentially, what you're saying here is that a a smart account like Safe can can have multiple types of signers verifying and executing, sort of signing for the for the transaction. But at the end of the day, at the end of the transaction, an EOA needs to execute that transaction on chain and pay the gas fee. So, like we encounter this basically every time we do a Safe transaction, you know, all of us sign. And then we have like one account that has just like a bunch of ETH on it and it's just used to pay for gas. And, you know, that account basically executes the transaction and sends it on chain. And that has to be an EO account. It can't be some other sort of signer or even another smart account. It has to be an on-chain account. Exactly. At least uh, so far. And it, it doesn't even need to be an EOA that the user controls. So even in the past, there were uh, relayer systems uh, like a Biconomy or Gelato or private relayers that are just EOAs that are funded that then uh, are instructed that once there's a smart account transaction that's like fully uh, verified and uh, fully signed that then this relayer system would would take with the EOA and, and pay for the gas fees and put on chain. And right. uh, that's where then ERC-4337 comes in where we say that uh, the idea should be that we have sort of like a separate mempool for these smart account transactions uh, where we can just add the smart account transactions that are fully signed, uh, fully valid, and then we have a decentralized mechanism how these transactions are then put on chain. There's actually still an EOA involved. So that's uh, the EOA that the bundler in the in, in the standard controls. The bundlers are just uh, collecting all the different smart account transactions and are then uh, bundling them together and, and put them on chain uh, by paying for the gas fees and 
using the, the EOA and they can then get uh, repaid for this gas fee expenses by Paymaster, which is not a component of this standard, uh, which then allows that uh, the bundler isn't sitting on the cost, but actually get out net zero or ideally even with, with some profit. Uh, and exactly the, the standard now uh, allows that there's no kind of centralized relayer involved anymore. Users don't need to fund their own EOAs, but they just trust that there's these decentralized networks of bundlers that they can just throw in uh, the transaction and it gets executed in a trustless way. Okay, so to, to recap here, so ERC-4337 uses existing smart account or leverages existing smart account infrastructure, but uh, offsets the execution or, or sends the responsibility of the execution to this bundler network. That bundler network does the on-chain execution of any smart account transaction that is ERC-4337 compatible and that therefore alleviates the initiators of that transaction to have to, well, A, execute it and B, pay for, for the on-chain gas costs. Does ERC-4337, by bundling these transactions, I suppose it also implies gas optimization because you're bundling all these transactions together and possibly saving on gas by doing so? Uh, there is some component of, of gas savings. Um, in the end, the ERC-4337 architecture adds some gas overhead itself, uh, but assuming that like there's a lot of adoption of the standard over time, the overhead decreases, and even at some point that there should be ways to, to even have uh, better gas efficiency than just using like a smart account natively itself. Right, and just to come back to this uh, signing and execution process, so what, when you... You know, I've encountered this a bunch of times where like we start a transaction and then we we realize maybe the, the amount was wrong or there's like some issue with the transaction as we're signing it. This happened recently, right? Where like I had a zero two few, right, on in, in my amount. And and so then, you know, you, you, you have to go through this process of um reverting the transaction, and that's because because you've already signed part of that transaction. At any point in the future, other signers could sign for the rest of that transaction and actually execute it. Now, when it comes to this bundler network, you know, a transaction that has been fully signed is basically ready to be executed. Is there another step then that the signers of that transaction um, have to make in order for that transaction to be made, say, public, or does it remain? within the hands of the signers and kind of private until an action is taken to reveal it to anyone, including this bundler network, to then execute it on chain. There's probably two steps to that. Uh, one is that after the partially signed transactions can stay private until it's fully signed and it's sent to the to the bundler network, yet still like others that are participating, for example, in a multi-signature use case, have access to this partially signed transaction. So they could complete the transaction and send it to the bundler network uh, at a later point. But once it is uh, sent to a bundler, then you need to assume that it's out there and it could be executed at any point. But this itself is not different than to how EOAs work as well. If you sign a transaction MetaMask today, if you have a too low of a gas fee and it's just stuck in the mempool, like it can be executed at any point, which uh, you can resolve by sending the transaction again with a higher uh, gas fee uh, in order to speed up the transaction or by replacing the transaction on the same nonce with a different transaction. So that would also be the case with smart accounts. They also have a nonce. Uh, so once a transaction then is executed at the same nonce, that means that the other partially signed transaction or fully signed transaction is not able to be executed anymore uh, and can be disregarded. Um, but up until that point, when the nonce is still available and the transaction is, is out there, like it needs to be assumed that it can be executed. I guess we've clarified here that ERC-4337 is related to uh, executing transactions. Are, are, is there an EOA that is uh, creating a standard for how smart accounts should uh, be conceived, like uh, in terms of the architecture of the start smart account, or is that up to smart account like 
companies and and service providers to decide as long as they are compatible with ERC4337, they can do whatever they want on the software side. Yeah, so ERC4337 itself has already some uh, requirements towards smarter cons. Uh, for example, that it requires that a smarter con transaction is starting from the account itself, uh, which is relevant if you think about modular smart accounts. So you might have different execution logic uh, for an account and uh, have it depending on what type of transaction it would require a different signature scheme or, or so on. Uh, and there the transaction needs to start in the account and then go to the to the module, which contains the execution logic, uh, which, yeah, there's some details there that just define how the, the account works. There's other ERCs that uh, standardize certain patterns for smart accounts, such as proxy patterns, uh, or now more recently, again, with modular smart accounts, there's uh, certain initiatives from the community that say the idea should be that we can create these different modules, which you can imagine to be in a way like uh, apps on a smartphone. Uh, so we shouldn't go to a world where you change your account in order to kind of add a new feature to it, be it like a session key recovery uh, or, or something like that. But instead, it should be like downloading an app on your smartphone. And that's enabled through these modular smart accounts, which means that you have your base account, which has, has certain default logic. And you ex expand that with uh, modules. This can be validation plugins. These can be certain safeguards that are added to an account and that then extends the, the logic of the account. And there, there's now initiatives that say we want to have yeah certain parts of this architecture, of this modular architecture be the same across different smart account implementations. Uh, why should we do that? Uh, the idea is that you then don't have to create these uh, modules for different implementations separately, but you can actually assume that they have certain standards that they comply to and the module that you create for smart account A works the same way also with smart account B. These are, yeah, there's actually two standards out there as always. Um, you have, <laughs> it's not enough to have one standard, you have to have a second standard and then a third standard to get rid of the other two um, and so on. Uh, but yeah, there's ERC 6900, uh, which was started last summer by the Alchemy team. And you got ERC7579, which is a collaboration between Rhinestone, Biconomy, OKX, and others uh, that define different ways how these modular smart accounts could look like uh, with some different yeah, technical assumptions. Concretely, ERC6900 bundles the modular architecture also with a permissioning system. So you say you have these different modules and you want to give uh, certain permissions to these modules as a security function and ERC 7579 is a very minimal standard that really just focuses on the modular architecture of smart accounts and uh, leaves the security, the permissioning system uh, potentially to a future ERC uh, and just says we shouldn't overcomplicate things, we should just focus on one thing after the other and uh, yeah, these standards are in a way competing at this point from the safe perspective, we actually want the safe smart account to be compatible with any standard. Uh, so that's possible as safe itself has some native modularity uh, built in. Uh, so it already has some uh, some ways you can extend the, the smart account. And then you can just add an adapter in order to be compatible with ERC 16900 or add another adapter to be compatible with 7579, uh, which makes it just future proof. Uh, it's still unclear how these standards evolve. They're all still quite early, got uh, yeah, little adoption so far, and they might still change over time. So our philosophy there is that we want safe smart account really to be as uh, low level as possible so that no matter how these standards evolve, you can just add another adapter to, to support them and you have a, an account that lasts forever. Incredible. And so what is SAFE's design philosophy here? I mean, because you get you guys have like SAFE core, which is the, the core of the of the SAFE product and, and the smart contract uh, logic. And do, do you think that that this should be kept as, as as minimal as possible in terms of features and all extensions sort of bring into the functionality? Or are you more like this conservative uh, approach to design? Or do you have more of a 
a broader approach to design where this core uh, could also include other functionalities that are currently being fulfilled by the plugins or, or modules. Yeah, I mean, there's um, probably two key uh, philosophies uh, for SAFE. One is that SAFE, as the name says, is, is very much focused on security. Uh, so that just de defines everything we do at SAFE in terms of like how we approach uh, upgrades to the smart account, how we approach, yeah, how we balance, for example, as a flexibility versus security versus gas efficiency. So we always default uh, more towards the security side. Uh, and the other one is that we want to be as uh, use case agnostic and user group as agnostic as possible, uh, meaning that the, the account itself, uh, the core safe smart account should be a base primitive, but then you can expand it depending on, on the use cases uh, and uh, optimize then through its modular architecture to different, yeah, to different ways to, to use uh, the smart account. And yeah, that also means that we very much depend on uh, the ecosystem around safe uh, so that's something that was 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 clear early on that uh, if you really want to bring web3 uh, towards smart account adoption if we want every account to be a smart account which is our mission like we cannot uh, aim to do this ourselves we really rely on an ecosystem and a community of builders uh, to to help us with that so what the idea is that the safe smart account becomes this very core of uh, of this smart account transition and then we have others that are building the different use cases be it different types of wallets be it uh, yeah, asset management solutions that then have built around this this core primitive and extend with what what's needed for them is it automations is it session keys maybe for a gaming use case uh, is it more pass keys if you want to build a retail wallet and uh, that then kind of puts us into a role of uh, of building this core protocol and working together with the ecosystem through ecosystem support initiatives uh, to to kind of yeah, target these different user groups uh, from their perspective. So in Safe Core, there's 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 multiple components. We have the smart account, which we've talked about. Uh, there's also the SDK that sits on top of it, which allows, like you said, you know, wallet developers to utilize the Safe infrastructure. But we haven't talked about the API, which I think is kind of an overlooked aspect of, of Safe Core and the way I understand it, I mean, one of the roles of the API, of course, is to kind of coordinate around these signatures. So like when you're signing a, a, a safe transaction and that transaction then pops up on the wallet of, say, your co-signer uh, or like another signer in the, um, in the wallet configuration, that is happening via an API that I'm not exactly sure how it works. So I, I don't know what is Gnosis's or sorry, Safe's, the company's. Uh, involvement in running infrastructure, it's kind of centralized infrastructure that makes that possible? Or is there an on-chain component there? I'd love it if you could explain how the API works and who are the the, the third parties that it may rely on. The smart account, really, the, the smart contract suite is uh, the, the core of it all, but then we provide tooling for developers that just make it more accessible. If you want to build an application using smart accounts, if you want to use a, uh, to build a wallet, uh, then Things like an SDK or API just make this more accessible, make make the transition from EOAs easier, uh, and yeah, that we we just always evaluate what's the things that we can provide to the ecosystem in order to make it uh, easier to build on smart accounts. And right now, it's an SDK uh, that just allows to have yeah to interact with the smart accounts to uh, craft signatures uh, and so on, uh, and to also work with uh, the ERC four three three seven relaying network and the API, as you say, that's, it's essentially an indexer, uh, or the most part is an indexer. So it just indexes all the safe smart account transactions out there and makes them available for developers. So you can say, uh, you can track different, uh, saves, for example, there's also an event service to it. So you can track if there's any updates to it, if transactions are triggered, if any incoming assets and, and so on, in order to display this to the user, but it also has a component of the signature collection which is especially in a multi-signature use case quite critical because you don't want to have every signer in a multi-sig sign on-chain. At least in, in most cases, you, you might want to save on the gas cost of signing on-chain and you just sign a signature, um, sign the transaction off-chain, but then you need a way to exchange these 
partially signed transactions with other participants of the multisig. And uh, that's done also via the, the API. So you can just post these partially signed transactions and retrieve them uh, from another user. Uh, and that just allows to, to exchange these transactions. Technically, it would be possible to exchange these transactions for any other means. We have also on-chain signatures, of course, but also by just downloading a file and sending it to someone else. Obviously, that's not very user-friendly, but yeah, that's why we provide this service. It's also an open source service. So there, there are projects that run it themselves uh, just as a redundancy. Uh, and we eventually also want to get to a place where there's actually a decentralized network of, of indexers that participate in, in retrieving and uh, yeah, kind of sharing these uh, partially signed transactions uh, just because it's it's always better to not rely just on a, on a centralized service, even though like anyone could run the service themselves and so on. But the, the truth is that uh, it probably would take quite some time until some other uh, service would, would spin up that has a, a similar performance uh, that would then kind of step in if if our indexer would be down. Or so so kind of the pathway towards this decentralized index network is, is something that we are uh, looking into. Yeah, okay, interesting. So so currently for all of the safe wallet products, I guess safe is running that infrastructure in a kind of centralized way, but as a user you can choose to either run your own infrastructure or if you're a company using safe, you can also run that infrastructure yourself for redundancy. But but you can also share the signatures on chain, correct? Exactly. Okay, interesting. Now that might make sense on some networks that have like lower gas costs, but on Ethereum that might be a bit prohibitive yeah and it also makes sense um uh, as this service is only run for a certain set of of uh, of networks uh, on that net networks where the index is not run you can still sign on chain and it also is an additional redundancy if the the service is not available then you could just with some little extra gas cost you could sign on chain and and uh, not be dependent on it okay Great, this is cool. Thanks for clearing that up. On the yeah, on the wallet side, I'd like to talk a little bit about the the user experience here and what are the, some of the challenges that you guys face when building in a wallet that you know supports uh, Safe Core. And you know, I, I like to preface this by saying like, I've had my share of moments using Safe where I didn't really know what was happening or. <laughs> where my transaction was in the queue or whether like, you know, trying to sign a transaction is not working and I'm getting some weird error message. And I've actually talked to safe uh, support like two or three times when executing a transaction and they've always been very helpful and have helped to sort of clear things up. But yeah, how do we, how do we come to a better user experience around, around these things? Because it's still super cumbersome. I mean, especially if you're using a ledger and then you sign with MetaMask and it all feels very cumbersome. And I still like, I still stress every time I do a multi-sig transaction because there's just all these moving parts that need to work. And it, it, it always feels like a bit of a, a lift <laughs> to, to get that transaction signed. So yeah, what are your thoughts on, on user experience generally? And how can we, how can we improve all this? That's actually interesting because there's like, two camps here uh, some people say like the the safe wallet interface is already quite user friendly and, and some still have issues it's probably also to, to some extent if you compare where safe wallet is today compared to where, where it is two three years ago i would say there's like a massive improvement in user experience since then but obviously it's still a long long way to go also challenge there is that we want to have safe wallet be as user group and use case agnostic uh, so we cannot optimize for say someone that's super technical that wants to see like all the information and uh, always be able to to look under the hood of, of everything at the, at the same time optimized for someone that is less technical that really wants to have everything abstracted away uh, so we always try to be somewhere in, in in the middle and then actually work with the ecosystem to provide the the best experiences for the different user groups uh, so for example there's an on-chain then which specializes really on multi-signature in, in a team use case and having transactions. They say that the, the, the uh, interface that allows you to do, kind of sign transactions the, the fastest and uh, they have like some, yeah, some uh, notification system behind it and so on and some, some gas abstraction. And they do so certain optimizations there. And then there's 
others like a, a Nest wallet, which is optimizing more for individuals and, and, and retail users that allow allows them to abstract a little bit more from the details away and have like a more smooth user experience uh, where maybe the cross team collaboration part is less of a focus. Uh, so that's really our strategy that we say safe wallet is like a, a baseline. It, it should be like a, an interface that people can start using in order to get experiences with, with smart accounts to, to cover uh, certain use cases. But then as you over time, there should really be like a, a wide ecosystem of of, of designated solutions that optimize for uh, for different uh, yeah, user groups. No, that's cool. I, I made a note of these. I, I think I'll probably try them out as well. This uh, so you said on chain den and nest wallet. Yeah, I mean with like the the some of the issues I've faced were were yeah I think like ordering of of signing and and then you know not able to post a transaction on chain and you know having to update that transaction with a new nonce like these kinds of things are very unintuitive i think for most people and even me and you know the error message really doesn't explain much of what you need to do so i think having kind of a in-app resolution mechanism to kind of fix this problem you know without having to reach to support or look you know look for things online and the other thing is i think there's i find there's like some inconsistencies between the way the wallet the mobile wallet works and the the desktop works uh or the, the kind of web version and one thing i've never really understood is with the with the mobile wallet and by the way the mobile wallet's great like i typically do transactions on the mobile wallet i think that that's the best user experience i think for you know for what we do and and we have a bunch of ledgers that we sign with. And I love that the mobile wallet supports the ledger and we can just like pull them out and get together and, and you know, sign things. Um, but there's one thing I don't really understand is like why you need to have a, it, it seems like you need to have an on device account. So like when you create this save for the first time, you need to have like a, a seed phrase that you have to store somewhere. It's generated on the, it's generated in the app and I haven't found a way to be able to sign the transactions with anything else than that on wallet account. I can't execute with the, with the ledger, uh, which kind of seems a bit backwards to me. If we're going to have ledgers to, to sign safe transactions to then have to have this less safe kind of hot wallet, you know, uh, on the device. So that's, that's, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm doing something wrong here, but that's uh, always been a little confusing to me. Yeah. Are you using Android? No, iOS. iOS. Um, okay. Uh, because technically it should be possible to execute also with Ledger. Um, so the idea about the mobile wallet is that it's it should be just a very smooth way to, to co-sign transactions and you can add any kind of like wallets to, to do so, like Ledger via Bluetooth or uh, like mobile wallets via Wallet Connect. And uh, yeah, uh, I can look into this, <laughs> I think. Uh, it... Yeah, we'll have to talk after. <laughs> But yeah, so there's like these kind of minor UX things that I find, you know, can be, can be improved, but overall, uh, you're like, I, I agree with you that the experience generally is, is, is pretty good, um, you know, compared to look like 10 years ago, Brian and I used to do Bitcoin transactions, in Electron wallet, and we'd have to send the partially signed transactions over Slack. And, you know, it was a huge mess, right? I mean, like this is definitely a huge leg up from having to do this kind of shenanigans which you know for, for people who have been in this space long enough will will be will be familiar with yeah and uh, i mean that's something in terms of user experience that's very close to my heart because i think in general the web free space like we're, we're staying saying things since years that we're still early and at some point we cannot uh, allow us to, to say that anymore because we it's still quite cumbersome if you want to do full self-custody and interact with with dApps and like that's still not that accessible to a wide range of uh, of people like in in the world. Like e even just having pretty much everything default to English, like that that's fine for certain parts of the Western world. But we need to uh, have more localized solutions. But also in general, how the UX works of of wallets today, uh, there needs to be so much more that that we should do uh, in the next years. And that's also why I'm so excited about smart accounts because I think. In the long run, these smart accounts will be the solution and there's no way around smart accounts in order to get to the user experience while still retaining like security uh, that is needed to to onboard like a billion people to to Web3. Yeah, I think smart accounts are, are a huge unlock there. And 
I'm really looking forward to more broad adoption of passkey and uh, other ways of signing. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but in the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, Osmosis, which is the major DEX there, are doing an on-chain smart account. Now, of course, the difference here is that they manage the entire chain and they can uh, really build things uh, on-chain and also have certain types of transactions be uh, either gas subsidized or gas optimized. And so they, the idea here is to do a smart account on-chain that you can set up using you know, OAuth, like a Twitter account or a Google account, and then based on the, um, on the value of the transactions you're doing, or perhaps even the value uh, in the, on the account itself, then you, you'll be required to add a second factor authentication. So it could be like a passkey or, or a secondary account to sign. And, you know, they're building all of this infrastructure on the chain, which is, which is great when you're doing your own chain. And, you know, brings me to another question I wanted to ask you is what's um, safe strategy when it comes to building its cross-chain presence and by cross-chain, I don't mean just EVM chains, which I know you guys are supporting very well, but other ecosystems like Solana, like Cosmos chains, like the Move ecosystem, uh, the you know Aptos and Sui. You know, are you guys looking at those ecosystems at all and thinking of ways that Safe can support those, or is your focus really just the EVM and you'll stick to you know what you're great at? I would say when it comes to cross-chain, uh, smart accounts in the short term will bring new challenges in, in the long run will actually solve cross-chain in a way that it can uh, make it irrelevant in what uh, networks you interact with, what dApps, but this can be abstracted away uh, through uh, through smart accounts. But yeah, in, in the short term, there, there are challenges. One of them is that smart accounts, they are they are just very uh, unique per chain. So because these are smart contracts, they deploy it on a certain network. Uh, they have the logic on that network, uh, which means that while it's possible to have a similar smart account on a different network with the same uh, logic, potentially even the same address through Create2 counterfactual deployment, uh, they're still very much independent accounts, which is a difference towards EOAs, uh, which are uh, by design, because it's kind of standardized, especially in the EVM ecosystem, like you have a seed phrase and it's immediately an account on all uh, EVM networks. So that's that's going to change. It has to change, uh, and there are solutions that are being worked on in terms of like key stores that uh, are accessible cross chain and uh, ways to to sync the state uh, across the chain. So we'll eventually solve that. There was just recently like a, a spec on that from Michael from Base uh, that that goes into that. That that's one thing. And then the the other challenge will be that smart accounts they are uh, very much dependent on the virtual machine. Uh, so you can have uh, a smart contract that creates your your account, uh, but obviously that's very much uh, dependent on what uh, smart contract lang language you use for implementation, and all the security assumptions are dependent on the the virtual machine behind it. So it's possible to create a similar smart account then across uh, non EVM chains like a Solana or or else, uh, but uh, this will necessarily you remove certain technical assumptions that you can take certain security assumptions and you will have to uh, build up the, the trust into this smart account from scratch. So there's uh, similar solutions to save on say Solana, that's like a squad that have been around quite a while and that do similar things. And for safe, the near to midterm focus will still be EVM. I think there's enough that can be built there in terms of smart account adoption on DVM itself. Uh, it's, it's a huge ecosystem and there's it just allows to move faster if you can make the technical assumptions on the Ethereum virtual machine. But obviously, in the long run, this should not be limited to, to that. And uh, safe in, in some way or another should be uh, also yeah, available outside of the EVM itself. And whether that then means integrating with some of the other implementations of, such as the squads uh, on, on other networks, that's yet to be seen. Uh, but that, that's definitely in the long term, say three to five years, something that needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see safe in other ecosystems, I mean, brought mostly because like solutions I think are lacking. Yeah, I, I think that in the next one to two years, we'll see safe competitors emerge in those ecosystems, like native solutions emerge in those ecosystems, which will, you know, half mover, first mover advantage and 
likely make it difficult for SAFE to really gain a, a, a foothold in, in those ecosystems, maybe, you know, with the exception of like existing customers on the SAFE on the EVM side that have assets there that want to move those assets into other ecosystems. When, when it comes to the EVM ecosystem and the cross-chain compatibility, what's the progress in terms of being able to control cross-chain accounts from like a single account? So for example, you know, if you had assets on uh, or you had like a safe account on on Polygon and wanted to control a- assets on another account by signing something on Polygon. Like, are, is there any progress in in the um, in the direction of interchain accounts as we call them in, in Cosmos? So these are accounts that can be controlled externally uh, by an, an account on another chain. Is that also something that it can exist within the safe ecosystem in the EVM world? Definitely. Um, so that's what I mentioned before. Uh, on key stores. Uh, so that's actually something that was proposed by Vitalik Buterin uh, last year. And uh, now certain uh, teams are, are looking into. Uh, the idea is that you should have the ability to have multiple smart accounts, uh, but have the the core validation logic or the, the logic, what keys are associated with that account separated into a separate contract, which is a key store contract, which then allows you to have less of that logic in the account itself. And you just say from the account, you then make a state proof towards that key store. And uh, then it allows you to see what's actually the, the account logic and and uh, prove that against uh, the transaction. Um, and that can then be taken cross-chain as well, actually in via a designated rollup. So that could be like a key store rollup uh, that then contains the logic of your account. And you have your sub account, so to say, on different networks. Um, could be EVM, could be beyond EVM that just allow you to use a cross-chain state proof against this key store rollup in order to uh, prove what uh, what keys or what uh, validation logic this, this account has. Uh, and then this essentially means that you will have cross-chain smart accounts that can then be allow you to, think, to, to achieve things like complete network abstraction where for a user or a developer, it doesn't even matter where the transaction is starting and where it's uh, pointing at, but this is then abstracted away uh, by having these cross-chain smart accounts. Um, it, I would still say it's like maybe six to 12 months out until we uh, have first production-ready implementations of such keystore rollups, but there's like major teams working on that. And uh, I'm, I'm 100% sure that we're going to that direction. And it's going to be first maybe uh, optimized for certain sub-ecosystems, say the Optimism ecosystem or the Scroll ecosystem, but over time, it will expand and even go go beyond the EVM, where you can have like a key store rollup, which is based in Ethereum layer one, but as a rollup in order to optimize some gas efficiency. Uh, but then allows you to yeah prove that that verification state towards any other networks. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's uh, a mostly like untapped kind of feature uh, in in the EVM world. This this ability to control accounts. Uh, cross chain, you know, again, like in, you know, in Cosmos, we have standards for this and, and it exists and we're able to do this pretty easily, but, but in the EVM it, world, it's, I think it's, it's still needs a little bit of time in order to become production ready. So you guys recently announced this, uh, I think it was last year, this recovery hub. So safe added all these different kind of methods to do recovery. And you have some, um, partners there that I guess can act as uh, third-party signers in the event of lost keys. What does this look like? And what are the kind of trust assumptions that users of SAFE have to make in order to be using this recovery feature? Yeah, so the idea behind recovery is that you may have more user-friendly ways to get keys into the hand of, of users, be it like pass key signers or be it uh, social login signers, such as like login with Google or something like that, but still... You want to have a worst case scenario uh, way to recover access to your account. And that actually, at least in my opinion, it, it's something that's very uh, idiosyncratic to the user itself. So there might be different users that want to have different ways to recover the account. Some like trust their family and friends. They just want to have sort of like a multi sig controlled by their family and friends uh, controlling their account. And if they lose their own keys, they just uh, approach these. Uh, social recovery signers and, and ask them to initiate a recovery. Others may 
trust an institution such as a, a bank or a notary or, or something like that that can execute the recovery uh, in, in certain cases, even in inheritance cases, worst case. And um, yeah, there's even for others that may trust some like decentralized network of uh, like a yeah, humanity doll kind of uh, system that then verifies the identity of, of someone that then can be used to recover the account uh, through some uh, identity verification. And how we're thinking then around what we built in terms of the foundations for enabling these use cases is that we created this recovery hub, which is very much a agnostic system to add different recovery systems. And we're working together with partners in order to showcase some of these capabilities. Uh, so the very base logic of the recovery hub is that you can add a module, which is like a separate smart contract, which has access to your account as an admin key. But then you add security guards that make sure that this uh, admin key is, is somewhere, some, somewhat yeah, protected. That um, and that can be depending on, on what the user prefers. It's usually like a, a time lock, so that a user can say this separate contract can recover my account, but only by having a time lock of like three months. So it kind of needs to pre-sign the, the recovery, and in that three months, I could uh, cancel the recovery. Uh, if I have access to my keys, and this then allows to have less trusted system where I may, may delegate this admin key to my social recovery setup or to this institution, but still have the certainty that they cannot go rogue and just run away with the account. There's other ways to, to add security, such as Signum, which is a Swiss licensed bank, which is building a recovery system for the recovery hub. What they're doing is that they limit the capabilities of this this recovery module uh, to only exchanging certain signers in the account. Uh, so the logic goes like this recovery module can exchange signer A, but not signer B, C, or D. Uh, and this can be then configured by the user. And they can say just this one signer, which I, I trust uh, Signum to, to recover, uh, I, I set up. And this then just limits what Signum can do with the account. And again, with some time lock, so there's an additional protection through that. But essentially, the, it's it's very open-ended what can be done there. And there can be vast amounts of different ways that uh, these, these recovery setups are being created. And are there any uh, kind of best practices? Like, so if, if someone wanted to set up a multi-sig account or, you know, a, a smart account and then have a recovery, I think one of the things that you internally we spent a lot of time thinking about was, okay, what is the key distribution setup look like? Like who has keys? Where are they? Where are the seats uh, stored? You know, what other third parties outside of our organization might have access to these keys uh, for backup or recovery purposes? Does SAFE make any recommendations or best practices or rec recommend best practices when it comes to doing this kind of, you know, smart account set up within an organization? I mean, we usually recommend to use a threshold of more than one. That's obvious. You want to have multi-signature, uh, not just a one out of five where every one of the members of the organization can do whatever they want. Uh, so there's at least multiple people looking over a transaction. And then we also recommend to not use uh, a threshold that's equal uh, to the number of signers. So not to any five out of five schemes, because that will mean that only one key needs to be lost and uh, the account uh, is not usable anymore in case you don't have a recovery. So that's always dependent on also what recovery setup you use. Obviously, if you have a, a very trusted recovery setup, then it might make sense to have like a five, five out of five if you have this have emergency way to, to recover the, the account. But in, without that, have at least like a three out of five. That's enough for uh, having multiple people co-sign, uh, but that also allows for some people to not be available at certain times or also certain keys to be uh, lost and in order to to create key rotations afterwards, uh, but th that's just very basic recommendations I would do. In general, it it very much depends on on the specific use cases and like how many people are involved, like what's the trust assumptions between these people and so on. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and there's also kind of catastrophic. You know, we we thought a lot about this this catastrophic scenario where since the team often travels together. If there was a catastrophic scenario where we were to all perish, how would you know heirs or other stakeholders be able to recover keys 
in that event. And so we had to think about safeguards there as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I think for a lot of teams that have set up multi-sigs and that are managing you know, significant amounts of capital on, on these accounts, they've probably gone through similar reflections and, you know, thinking about the best scenario. I, yeah, I, I don't think there's a one size fits all solution for everyone, but certainly like, you know, some best practices here, I think generally would be, would be useful. I don't know if anyone's thinking about these things or publishing anything about this, but I, I hadn't found anything like those, um, very useful for, for our, for our use case. I wanted to also talk a little bit about security at safe. So you guys recently passed a hundred billion dollars in assets secured by the protocol. I guess that's, that's cross ecosystem or, um, cross, cross EVM chains. That's a lot of responsibility on, on the safe team. And I would argue that if something were to happen, if there was a bug in the safe smart contract that not only the, uh, multi-sig holders would suffer, but I think the entire ecosystem would probably suffer quite a bit. Yeah. What does that evoke for you? And, um, what does the process look like? The the process of making sure these smart contracts are absolutely bulletproof. I must say I was, uh, more worried in the early years of safe, uh, than I am now, uh, because like the the vast amount of the security comes through its Lindy effect. So just having like a lot of value controlled through the smart accounts over time without there being any issues. And, uh, especially with, uh, like the safe smart accounts, we, we don't update them that often intentionally because every time you make a change to the, to the smart contract, that means that there, there could be potentially any like, kind of risks associated with that. Uh, so we are not kind of adding new features. Uh, just to the base contract, but we, we allow this with modules and then there's the, the different uh, kind of security assumptions that, that's behind there. But yeah, generally, also because it's not just a hundred billion uh, dollars worth of, of assets that are secured, but also like critical infrastructure, uh, be it like cross-chain bridges, be it restaking protocols, be it stable coins that uh, can use safe smart accounts under the hood in order to control certain upgrade parameters and, and so on. Like it, it is quite critical that the, the safe smart account is, is really bulletproof. And for that, we invest a lot into security. Uh, we uh, actually invested a lot also into formal verification. The, the very first major version of the, the safe smart account was formally verified over a period of six months uh, of, of uh, quite some time and, and financial investments that went into that. Obviously, multiple audits are always part of that. Having a bug bounty and the community bug bounty challenge that is associated with that. And like a big part of the security is also just on like in, internal processes and uh, how the culture is around security in the team uh, and, and so on. But yeah, the, the key part is, is still like the, the Lindy effect. And that's something where I would argue at this point with that much at stake, if there would be any major issue with the safe smart account, no one could tell, but like I would assume this would almost be a reason to uh, to initiate a hard fork. And uh, for me, this is also a signal that if, if people assume this would happen, at some point it would make sense to even make certain components of the safe smart account really part of the Ethereum uh, protocol. So really enshrine that and make make it very explicit and say, like, this is logic that we expect to to behave a certain way. Uh, and if it if it's not that case, then it would be a consensus kind of consensus issue and it kind of would uh, lead automatically to have fixed that or it would be like a, a bug in a client or something rather than a bug in the smart contract and I would assume that eventually we will have to to move towards that if we see that certain parts of the safe smart contracts are really ossified we don't expect them to to change much in the future we should just make them part of the protocol yeah yeah I agree that I think that would also solve a lot of the user experience issues and, and also the, uh, you know, so the gas issues surrounding, you know, using safe, obviously like on Ethereum mainnet, like using safe can be quite expensive and having that enshrined in the protocol, I think would make sense long-term. And also in terms of just adding new features and having smart contracts, being able to leverage safes, I think there's like a huge benefit of saying like, okay, this infrastructure should be enshrined, uh, so that most, most new accounts would be smart accounts. Right. And, um, so. Let's take a step back here and talk a little bit about the 
Gnosis ecosystem generally. So obviously like safe is a huge part of that. There's also Gnosis chain, there's Gnosis pay, and you guys have lots of other products and teams working on all sorts of infrastructure. How does safe fit in with all of this? And you know, what's the long-term vision for, I don't know if you can talk about like Gnosis generally, but uh, yeah, the Gnosis ecosystem. I mentioned it at the beginning, Gnosis originally wanted to do prediction markets. Uh, it was quite early, it was pre-DeFi uh, summer, and there was a lot of infrastructure missing uh, in order to even make prediction markets work. Uh, so there was no secure way to self-custody assets, which prediction markets would create a lot of assets, which need to be self-custodied. Um, there was not a good way to exchange assets um, because the prediction markets would create different tokens and they need to be exchanged in a, in a capital efficient way. And there's like a bunch of different things that were missing. And Gnosis was basically forced to uh, to build these things out themselves. Uh, and that's how in, in the end SAFE was created. That's also how CowSwap was created uh, over the years and, and other things. Also Gnosis became a DAO as Gnosis DAO. So suddenly there was infrastructure needed to really enable have community governance over Gnosis DAO. So that's where uh, Safe Snap was created, a way to connect a, a safe smart account with a snapshot space uh, in order to have off-chain voting, but have on-chain execution. And that's then how the Gnosis Guild team was born as a way, as a team that's optimizing on building DAO infrastructure. Uh, then Gnosis DAO had the treasury, which had to be managed. Uh, and that's where the Kapatki team was born, which is now, I think, the biggest asset manager for, for DAO treasuries. And they, they manage DAO treasuries like the one from Aave DAO or ENS. And like all these were initially internal teams, but at some point became uh, spin-offs. Uh, but obviously it's it's very much still a close ecosystem. So the different teams collaborate quite extensively. Uh, and now like the future for Gnosis uh, is very much centered around Gnosis Chain. Uh, which is another project that was actually picked up as XDAI in the past, which then was rebranded to Gnosis Chain. Uh, um, yeah, it's a sidechain to Ethereum and it allows for a horizontal scaling uh, of Ethereum block space. And uh, on, on Gnosis Chain, there's uh, the, the payments network Gnosis Pay being built out, which is really the, the second uh, focus next to, to Gnosis Chain itself, uh, which is a way to connect uh, DeFi with the traditional financial uh, system, uh, meaning that the idea is that you are able to really have your assets on-chain, uh, but able to spend them off-chain and uh, trigger bank transfers off-chain, but then result into on-chain transactions and really bridge the gaps between those two ecosystems uh, as a first step to hopefully then have more and more of the, the payment ecosystem actually move on-chain and not be have yeah, rooted still in the traditional financial systems, but then uh, get replaced over time with really true on-chain systems. So there also SAFE plays a very critical role in, in Gnosis Pay as it's the underlying uh, account standard for, for Gnosis Pay because something like Gnosis Pay actually needs smart accounts in order to work because it, it is meant to be like self-custodial account, which then still allows you to have a, like a card, like a traditional Visa card associated with it, which you can use to spend off-chain. And in order to bridge these assets off-chain, you need to have a way that they can be taken from the account and then put into the Visa network. Uh, but still, you don't want to just give like unlimited access of your, of your assets to some to the Gnosis Pay network there, uh, but you actually want to limit that. And that's, that requires smart accounts so that uh, every Gnosis card actually is associated with a safe smart account which has like a yeah a daily limit associated with that, where any transactions that are below this daily limit can be put into the, the Gnosis Pay network and and be used to to pay at the merchant store. Uh, but it's it's in a way that it have uh, still the vast majority of your assets are self custodial, and it's just uh, yeah this daily limit that you get then give. And yeah, the the long term vision is really that. Uh, Gnosis is focusing on on building out like this decentralized payment network that then leverages things like Safe, leverages things like CowSwap for uh, for exchange of assets and and other parts of the Gnosis ecosystem. 
it becomes really this uh, combination of, of the different infrastructure that was built over the last years and builds really something that can then bring as, as much as possible of, of today's payment volume on chain. Great. Well, Lucas, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. It's been great learning about SAFE, uh, understanding the the technical uh, implementation of SAFE and also uh, how it fits into the broader Gnosis ecosystem. So thanks so much for coming on and look forward to having you back on in the future. Yeah, it was a pleasure.